All right. So Amara Tabor Smith is a dancer, a choreographer, and the artistic director of Deep Waters Dance Theater and an artist in residence at Stanford University. And we also have Ramona Webb, who is also an artist in residence here at UCSF in the National Center for Excellence in Women's Health. And today we are talking about choreographing sacred movement. I just have to say, I'm a major fangirl of both Amara and Mona. So I'm having a whole moment and I'm trying so hard to compose myself. But both of these amazing women have supported me um, so deeply in my own healing journey and inspired my healing, particularly around ancestral healing arts um, and what Amara calls conjure art, um, supporting me with moving into the dark parts of my healing that aren't always pretty, that aren't always comfortable. So it's really beautiful for me to have the opportunity to kind of share space and invite y'all into this conversation um, that has been a dream for some time. So thank you, Amara. Thank you, Mona. So, so grateful um, to have y'all both here. And Mona can get us started uh, with the first question. Okay, I'll offer up our land acknowledgement briefly. Um, uh, as written by myself and Ken folks, I, Ramona Laughingbrook Webb and Apple Creek Muskogees, as individuals seeking social justice, we recognize the importance of committing to the everyday work of deepening our understanding of the history and actions that have led each of us to exist on this land, North America. So we begin this powerful work with the land acknowledgement. We intentionally recognize and respect Indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of this land and honor the enduring relationship that exists between Indigenous peoples and the traditional Indigenous territories. We acknowledge the Ohlone people and all Indigenous peoples whose traditional and unceded territories we are gathered upon today. We acknowledge the overlapping histories of the region, including continuing conditions of stolen indigenous land and power, in addition to the ongoing violence produced by the legacy of racialized slavery and oppression. We also recognize that the institutions and industrial complexes with which we struggle within have been complicit in the erasure of history and continue to benefit from and perpetuate processes of colonization, broken treaties, racism, colorism, bi homo transphobia, misogyny, dispossession, and displacement. Let us take a moment to extend our deepest thanks, gratitude, and appreciation to our shared ancestors, present elders, and emerging elders. Let us reflect in silence and then be mindful of conducting our work using words, actions, and intentions that demonstrate the honor and appreciation we extend to the Loney people and all indigenous peoples whose lands we sit and stand upon. And with this, let us take a deep collective breath in honor of our traditional stewards. and into our conversation with Amara Tabor Smith, <laughs> which is so incredibly exciting. I actually counted the years I have been watching you for the last 17 years. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and so just to name a few things of um, moments of note in this illustrious history and um, legacy of such a beautiful, beautiful career. We have you and the Urban Bushwoman, your relationship um, to uh, Pelota with Martha Moody Joseph, brilliant productions like Our Daily Bread, House Full of Black Women, which I believe I saw even the beginning of this work, which was absolutely stunning and this continues to grow in grace. Um, your work with Ellen Sebastian Chang and yeah, Deep Water Dance. I mean, Deep Water Theater, you, been everywhere from Eastside Arts Alliance to YBCA to the Brooklyn Art Museum. It's been my privilege and honor to watch all of this grow and mm -hmm. flourish. So tell us more about yourself, where you're from, what you do, um, what you love. Tell us more about the work you do with Deep Water Dance, House Full of Women, and how that work has been somatic, spiritual, collective, and ancestral healing how that work has centered narratives that the body needs to tell, that words cannot always say or name, or share it to us in oracle, whatever form feels really good to you. Wow, that was quite an introduction. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Re. Thank you, Mona. Yes, we go way back. Um, in the spirit of um, describing myself, I am a deeply, I say deep caramel brown woman with, um, I have my hair back in a bun, which I almost never do. Um, I have, I'm wearing uh, thick silver hoop earrings and I'm wrapped in a blue, dark blue indigo dyed cloth um, that has white 
um, markings on it, little uh, white markings. And I'm in my office with white wall behind me and a indigo blue cloth hanging from the shelf. Um, I'm really happy to be with y'all. Wow, that is a deep, deep, that's, there's so much to that. Um, so I am born and raised in uh, on uh, Ramatush Ohlone land in San Francisco. I was born and raised in San Francisco. I currently live in Oakland. I am the daughter of Francis and Clarence, granddaughter of Ella Gertrude, Maddie Alberta, uh, John Quincy, and um, uh, and and uh, Joe Smith. Um, I, let's see, what can I say? Um, yeah, I've been, this work, I started, I started out um, as a movement artist really young. Um, I will recognize the ancestor who is, um, functioned as my dance father, whose name was Ed Mock, may he rest in peace, Ibae. And uh, he was the one that made me want to be a movement artist. Um, he was a dance artist in San Francisco. I came up in a time in San Francisco that had a very large black population, had a very vibrant um, uh, art scene, dance and movement. Uh, dance, theater, um, music, really thriving, thriving art scene um, with uh, so many artists of color, so many Black and um, BIPOC artists of color. Um, yes, yeah, so you're going to have to help me out here. Where was I? Uh, you, you said something else. You just took me in so many places. <laughs> It's kind of getting an overview of where you are, where you come yeah. from, and yeah. how you and how this practice of spirit moves in our body, yeah. oracles that it brings forward. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, so my relationship with spirit is, um, as I think for most of us, uh, precedes this life, and yet I came into this world. Um, with memories um, from a very early age of, um, of other existences and also um, being um, accompanied by ancestors who guided me um, in in my early life uh so I came so as a child I would I would be visited by spirit um, I can talk more about that maybe later, but um, I did not see that. I, I came up in a family that um, my mother was also very spiritually in tune, but she wasn't trying to, she didn't, she didn't feel like she signed up for that, um, for that job. <laughs> and so she was pretty afraid of it. So coming up, I didn't have a lot of guidance around it. It wasn't really until I encountered my t my dance teacher Ed Mock that I I felt the presence. I I felt that I was in the presence of someone who was deeply tapped into spirit, and that's when I really um, first started to uh, feel that um, that work through dance. So I. Um, as a dancer, it was Ed Mock that I, you know, I would go to class and I, and I was going to church. That was my church. Um, I didn't come up going to church, um, but that was my church. And I started dancing with him when I was 13. He passed away from AIDS in 1980, complication of AIDS in 1986. And um, I was with him when he passed. And that you know, sent me on a journey to figure out how to find that connection, because at that point, that was my only connection. Um, and to fast forward, um, and then, uh, as you mentioned, Urban Bush Women, that was the next, I would say, container 
where I was working. Urban Bushwoman is a dance company based in New York City, led by uh, Jawale Willa Jo Zoller, who was the founder. And she really was uh, the first uh, artist that I had seen outside of my own experience with my teacher, Ed Mock, that was really blending a lot of um, ideas, the theater and dance and dance from an African diaspora movement perspective and also with an emphasis on um, uh, on on black women's experience. And um, I had not experienced that before uh, coming in contact with that company. And I had the privilege and honor of joining the company and in later in towards the end of my time with the company, I was also the associate artistic director um, of Urban Bushwomen. And, and, and my time with that company helped me to deepen um, my commitment and also figure out my pathways to bring spirit, social justice, dance, and theater together in a way, and also to raise the 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 visibility of Black women's ex and experiences. So that is, I want to recognize that time as being so instrumental to the evolution of my own my art practice. Um, when I was uh, midway through my time with Urban Bushwomen, I also um, I, I made a um, commitment to my spiritual practice, which is I am a practitioner of the Yoruba Lukumi tradition, um, known as the Orisha tradition. It's known as Isheshe um, Lukumi in, uh, in Cuba, known as Candomblé in Brazil. And I initiated as a priest um, in the tradition, initiated to the mysteries of Yamaya, the Orisha of the ocean. And, um, and in that time, um, uh, when I started, when I left Urban Bushwomen to start making my own work, um, it became really clear to me that uh, keeping my spiritual practice outside of my art making uh, wasn't going to work. I, I, I tried to keep those things separate because I didn't want anyone to feel that I was working with to feel like I was indoctrinating them into my belief system. Um, so I always kept it, you know, it was the ground for my art practice and my dance and performance making but it, um, but I didn't bring it openly into the process, and that changed. In I would say when I started, well, I started to introduce some of my spiritual practice when I did the piece Our Daily Bread, which Mona, you were such an important part of. But I still was keeping it, you know. Mm, we're we're working with these archetypes, but I didn't actually bring it into the work. And then um, a couple of years later, I was approached around um, doing a project, a site specific dance project in San Francisco. And it was then that um, the spirit of my teacher, Ed Mock, who I spoke about, um, came to me and said, I'm ready to come back and, you know, my spirit to be recognized. And he was the focus of that project, which was called He Moved Swiftly But Gently Down the Not Too Crowded Street. And that was, um, I called it a moving seance. So basically, it was a five and a half hour traveling site specific work that happened on the streets of San Francisco. And it was, it was a seance. And it was the first time, because we were calling his spirit back to the streets of San Francisco and also calling back the spirit of what San Francisco was prior to the rampant gentrification that took place in the nineties. And um, it was the first time that I brought a, 
I brought 35 uh, performers together and I said, listen, um, this, this work is a seance. So you don't have to believe, but you got to be willing to go along for the ride. And, um, and they did. And I actually lost a performer who was like, yeah, I can't get with that. And, you know, that was okay. You know, I really recognized that, you know, people have agency and that was important for them. And so after that, there was really no going back. And so Ed, you know, sort of, this was what I, I came to realize in the process. Number one, he guided the whole piece. You know, I, I really just did what I was told, <laughs> how that worked. And, um, and at that point, um, you know, the point, what I realized was that, oh, this was a piece to, for his, his spirit to seat as a working ancestor. Prior to that point, I felt like he was resting. His spirit was resting. And so he, he came back to work and, um, and then, um, there was no going back for me. And at that point, it was just a matter of me continuing to figure out how to um, integrate openly um, my ritual, my spiritual ritual practices in my art making. That was a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm just appreciating your reflections on how you bring spirit and ancestor work and conjure art, you know, into your work. And one of my questions was around like your spiritual gifts and fear. Um, but something that's also coming up just as you're talking is just like, I'm wanting to know, like, you know, how do you do ancestor work in your work, you know, and, and what are, like, you spoke a little bit about some of the challenges, but I struggle a lot because I am um, moving into this place where I'm bringing ancestor work into the way I'm understanding Black feminist healing arts and um, care for Black women. And it's really hard and heavy and challenging and difficult. And even though I have come into awareness about my spiritual gifts, I have a lot of fear, a mm -hmm. lot of intense fear. And I've heard you talk before about your mother and her fear around spiritual gifts. And I'm just wondering, like, how, how have you navigated fear? And how have you mm -hmm. navigated, like, spirit, like, practice rituals and conjure art for spiritual safety as you're moving through your spiritual gifts from when you were young, but also like, you know, from now as you're doing this work so actively and intentionally. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a continuous process, I will say, um, in terms of fear, you know, uh, for all of us, of course, there, you know, everybody is different in terms of, you know, where they have fear. So um, my mother's fear was, you know, my mother would see spirits. She was a seer. She is a seer. And um, she wasn't down with that, you know, um, and that really scared her, you know. Um, I think I, I'm i more of a feeler. I'm a seer secondary, but I I feel the presence of spirit. Um, and as a young person, I think when I was very young, I, I wasn't afraid because but I hadn't learned to be afraid yet. And I, th and, and, and the reason I wanted to go back there is because I think a lot of our fear is learned, right? We're, we're taught, oh, you don't mess with that. Cause you'll open something you can't close. And that's, you know, and I think that mm, I actually disagree. I, and at the same time, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a process of, um, you know, what are the, we, we as people of color, all people, quite frankly, but us as black people, as people of color have um, experienced so much trauma 
um, in our personal lives, generational trauma, ancestral trauma, and all of that moves through us. And being able to see what is yours and what is not yours, it takes work. But it, it and and I really do believe it. You know, when we're doing this spirit work that we need a multi-prong you know approach we have to ground ourselves we have to ground ourselves spiritually emotionally um all of you know i believe that most people need to be in therapy because sometimes things get confused right you think oh this is spirit and sometimes and spirit sometimes will protect us in our emotional trauma you know, like, um, so, so it's, you know, we need, we need to be constantly, I hate to say we need to be constantly working, but, you know, we need practices, consistent practices for our emotional health, for our spiritual, re our emotional recovery, our spiritual recovery, our social recovery, right? And so, um, you know, one of the things too is that we, you know, it's important to, I think the more that you delve in and are delving into your ancestor work is having practices that can, you know, sort of tools and methods for knowing, for creating good boundaries. Because the spirit world needs boundaries too, you know. Um, an example I'll give is following the piece I did for my teacher, Ed Mock, I delved into another piece. Um, I had a visitation by a, um, I, was, I was in a class that was um, focused on the work of an artist named Ana Mendieta who died tragically in uh, 1984. And um, I was actually embarking on a different project and I had an experience, uh, spirit possession come out of it. And the only thing I hear is, you know, you need to make a piece for me. And I didn't know much about this artist. Um, I had actually stayed away from this artist because when I first learned about her work, it a little, you know, I was a little intimidated and also knowing the events surrounding her tragic death were, I, I, it, I felt a lot. And um, when that happened, I said, okay, all right, I'm going to delve in. And there were a few things, there were many things that happened in that process that um, were somewhat frightening. Um, the, I, I said, I'm secondary a seer of spirit. I rarely see spirit. She was a spirit who came to me when I was in bed sleeping and I wake up and I see her right there. And I said, okay, wait, <laughs> hold up. I was like, I don't want to send you away, but you got to come. You got to be, you, you got to be gentle. I, you know, I, I want to do this work for you and you can't, wake me up in the middle of the night <laughs> it's just you know and so i use that example is that you know it's important to set boundaries it's also important to know you know as you delve in to do the ancestor work that you get really clear about which ancestors are your guides and which ancestors need elevation because the ancestors that need elevation are in need. They cannot be in, you know, they cannot be in support of you. They're looking for your support. So being really, um, you know, finding out what are the practices that you can develop to be able to distinguish because you don't, you know, I think because we live in a culture that's so where our mm, thinking is so dichotomous, right? It's like, it's either this or that right that okay well if they're ancestors they just know better no they don't necessarily we there are a lot of ancestors who still don't know that they're ancestors you know um that leave and get stuck and so 
we want to make sure that we, you know, we're we're in we're developing practices in our ancestor work, depending on how deep you're trying to go, you know, that you you really figure out which are the ones that are, you know, my guiding ones and which are the ones that need my guidance and be able to distinguish that. And that is that's through practice. And I really believe that, um, you know, uh, your ancestor work is not dependent on your spiritual practice, though some people may have spiritual practices that don't believe in ancestor worship or ancestor reverence, you know, and that's fine. Um, but I don't believe that, you know, I really believe that everybody has ancestors, that if you have a desire to work your ancestors, that you just do so and easy does it and, and really start to call in some methods to keep you grounded in the process. I don't know. Did that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. I think it's hard for me because I feel like my boundaries become walls and I really be like avoidant. But I experience mostly like clear audience. So mm -hmm. they be talking to me and I'll be like telling them not to because I'm scared. And then my boundaries be like so firm. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes I'll ease up like I have a few that mostly I communicate with, but it feels like they're wanting reciprocity like they want they need my help and I need their help I don't think I like I hear people talk about ancestors it's like oh my ancestors just got my back and they looking out I don't really experience a lot of like the ones that are so elevated and just here to help me it, it feels like it be coming with a lot of like they still healing, they still processing, but they are helping me, but they also need my help. So yeah, I just, I appreciate you so much for kind of like just naming um, some of those practices. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to be journaling about that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank yeah. You. Well, I just, you know, if I could say one more thing about that too, is that, you know, um, that even the wall, like the wall is not a bad thing. Sometimes you got to put up a wall if it just feels overwhelming, you know. Um, and there's a way, mm, this is what I think, you know, sometimes we forget. You don't have to do this work alone, you know, and that's, you know, that's another thing. I mean, uh, you can call in people like your actual living support and be like okay i want to sit and i want to do some ancestor work and i want you to sit here with me so that when i get afraid <laughs> that i i know i have somebody else present you know um because our practices they're they're even in our traditional practices where we you know we're sitting alone meditating or calling information in in actuality most of our our uh, our, our our spiritual practices and um and rituals were done in community you know and so remembering that is really important like you don't have to do this work alone and in and in some instances when there's a lot of fear you know it's it's absolutely appropriate to to call in your support networks of folks who who you know have an understanding of what you do if they don't do it themselves you know um so i think that that's an important piece like how do we do this work more collectively you know um yeah. Ashe, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, as we talk about the conjuring, let's talk about what is conjure art and how do spirits come through in the dance? Um, we've heard mm -hmm. dance is your prayer and wondering how dance, prayer, and conjure art coexist to create sacred convening in your own spiritual practice? And how does this nurture the four elements, water, fire, earth, and air, or inform the conjure art practice? Hmm. Well, um, to go back to the story I was telling you about making the dance piece for the spirit Ana Mendieta, um, the, the 
when I started using this term, I won't say that I created it because who knows, somebody else may have used this term before, but, um, but when I started using this term and creating a definition for conjure art, it was when I was making the work for Ana Mindieta, I felt like I needed a language or I wanted a language and a definition that I would now name this work that I was going to do moving forward. So when I made that work, um, it was the spirit of Ana Mendieta that actually elevated me even more so in my um, in integrating my spiritual practice more, um, br bringing this my spiritual practice more um, more in in integrated into my art making, and um, so I see uh, conjure art as you know the basic de the definition for conjure art that I created is that it's you know it's it's an art making practice whether it be visual art performance music writing um, that an artist does where they're integrating um, traditional um, and or indigenous spiritual practices into their art making and they are you know doing it in a um a way that may or may not be experiment experimental with the uh with the um spiritual practices um what's important is that and what and what i in that definition is that we're not doing it for the you know sort of the effect on the audience of you know who we brought spirit but that it's it's to actually shift the vibration of an issue of that it's that there's a responsibility and accountability to that i'm we're calling spirit through the art to change um to make social change to you know um to address issues um, of it, of the environment or you know social justice issues, um, so it's not just for our personal satisfaction, but instead it's not arts for art's sake. It's it's an in, it's intended to shift the vibration of an issue, um, and utilizing these practices that I believe a person doesn't necessarily have to be initiated into or a practitioner of a specific spiritual practice, but they should be in conversation with practitioners so that they are not um, extracting, they're not having an extractive or an exploitive uh, relationship to the spiritual practice that they're drawing from, but that they have, you know, um, they have done their research, they have, um, they are being held accountable to spiritual elders in the practices that they've learned from. Um, so it's a, you know, um, I think Re, you were talking about earlier, like the ancestors wanting reciprocity. That, that should be our relationship. And, you know, I, I'm not, I, I, I mostly speak for myself, but I think that in our world, the biggest issue is that we are in, um, we have been socialized to be extractive um, and to take what we want because we want to, you know, um, and not um, be held accountable or not be in reciprocity. And so with a conjure artist, there's, you know, there is a, um, you know, a commitment of reciprocity that needs to uh that needs to be adhered to so it's part of the process is like how are you being held accountable how are you taking the time to really um understand what it is you're doing and why so in the making of that work you know um i had to check in i did a lot of divination there were some things that i wanted to do that was like mm, no that you're not going to do that, you know, um, and and to be humble enough to say, okay, this isn't about my desire. This is about 
what is necessary in this art making, you know? And sometimes those things are aligned, you know? It's like, oh, I wanted to do that and that was the right thing. Um, but it's about getting in touch with, you know, it's, it's about really taking self inventory as to, you know, why do I wanna do this? You know, asking ourselves those questions um, as we're delving into that realm you know that we all have access to it's just that some of us are less experienced than others so that in a nutshell is how i see conjure art um i will say you know one thing i learned from making the piece for anna mendieta was you know i took my performers in to a place and spirit was popping off in rehearsals and so i said okay in performance we need to have spiritual attendance to attend to the performers so that when they come off the stage that they have you know they're able to reground well that was the first time that uh what through this process and deepening of this work that oh I need to also have spiritual attendance for the audience because people got possessed in the audience. And in fact, uh, we were in a, um, we were being presented in a theater with folks who are not familiar with our realms and uh, thought that a person who got possessed was having an epileptic seizure and they called the ambulance. And so I said, oh, right you know and and that was a learning like i did not know that that would happen i i and in hindsight i think what were you thinking <laughs> how did you think that wasn't going to happen you know and since then when i when i'm doing work that's you know deeply ritualistic i always have a spiritual attendant who's present in the space to be able to address when someone gets when they're when their an ancestor or spirits come mm. oh thank you so much amara and mona and i just had a whole moment about this just last week mona has been so supportive in so many ways because for the work that i'm trying to do now around ancestor work and we just uh mona just held space for me in in moving through this what i want to do versus what spirit want to do and it ain't in alignment i gotta surrender to spirit i gotta surrender um and so i'm so grateful for your definition of conjure art and so grateful that i have mona like spiritually holding my hand through this as well to like uh yeah just mm -hmm. help me and i appreciate you talking about community like we can't be just out here trying to do conjure art alone and and just how necessary it is to be like careful like full of care for oh, ourselves yes. for the audience for the performers like just for everyone um who's partaking in the experience uh, so thank you and mona i heard i saw you put in the chat y'all hear the ocean i'm like yep i'm here in the <laughs> ocean too <laughs> i'm here for it um so my final question before we open up to audience q a and i hope y'all are jotting your questions down because we are going to be getting into that audience q a real soon um but i'm really interested in how you think about and make sense of and be in practice with uh darkness and shadow mm. work i've you were the first person i ever heard like frame darkness in the way that you did and it always stuck with me just around like the womb and soil and that like there's so much um depth and richness in going into those dark places for us to kind of uh, move through the darkness to arrive at the healing and sometimes the healing is even in that darkness sometimes it's not about us trying to move out of the darkness into the light but like being with the darkness and honoring it as a sacred space as well so i'm just wondering if you can um speak more to that and mm -hmm. i'm gonna throw my other questions in a part of the q a and you can see that as one of the many questions to respond to right um yeah um so that goes back to what i was saying earlier about you know we are you know we've all been colonized i'm colonized i am you know my everyday practice is to um is to heal from that colonization and actually recover 
myself. And part of, you know, one of the ways that colonization works is for us to be afraid of the dark. You know, we're in this, the dark is bad, the light is good, except for that, you know, very little in any life form grows in, you know, um, is germinated in the light. Most everything is germinated in the dark. And um, so the dark space is, is, the, is the feminine, and which is why it is villainized, because it is, because in the dark is all, I believe in the dark is all possibility. What's laid out in the light has already been birthed and is already there. But in order for things to be born, we have to go into darkness. And because we live in a society that um, says, you know, for example, there's no grieving time. There's not no time for grief. Grief. Death is wrong. Life is good and death is bad. And there's no time for grief. Then our experience of the dark is one that feels um, heavy and, uh, you know, one that we want to, that we are afraid of and we don't want to experience. But in the dark is where, you know, our newness is born. And so um, I believe that working with, you know, and, and there's more, people are more talking about it now, like the shadow work is about darkness, right? It's about really going into our deeper healing. And that means sitting in that, you know, um, I remember when I was a kid, I use this metaphor sometimes, I used to be really afraid. I was, I would be afraid in the dark, but what I was really afraid of was my closet d door. If it was a jar, I was afraid because that was an absolute dark space. And I would, my stomach would turn. And one night I was just so sick of feeling, and I was maybe seven, I don't know. I don't know how old I was, but, I was so sick of feeling so afraid that I got up and I went and sat in the closet. And I sat in that completely dark space and felt that actually it held me. And so I, I offer that because, you know, I think because we don't have practices of grieving, we don't have a, a good grief a rituals, rituals for grief and for um, renewal that requires, you know, letting things go, letting things die off um, or transition, um, that we get stuck in just what feels hard because what we're doing is trying to scramble for the light. And so, you know, like you said, the darkness, you know, is a space to embrace because it's from there. We would not know light without darkness. And I, you know, and everything needs balance. We don't want to stay in that place. You know, we want our seed to sprout up into the light. But it's important that our seed gets to, you know, gets to, to be held you know, the womb space is is supposed to be a space of comfort, even for those of us who may have had difficult womb experiences as, you know, being in the womb. But that is a space that's supposed to hold us in comfort while we grow, while we change, while we, you know. And so new ideas are not born in the light. They're born in the dark. Ashe, thank you so much, Amara. And we are going to open up for Q&A now, and I'm going to cheat and ask my question in the Q&A, and then we're just going to take all of the questions that everybody yeah. has. So y'all go ahead and raise your hands. Um, but the question I didn't get to dive into is around temporality and embodiment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think a lot about this because I feel like when I'm experiencing an ancestral connection, I like it takes me out of embodiment and out of presence. Um, and like, I'm, I'm no longer here. And yet I feel like my healing is like needing me to be in my body so that I can, like you said, stay grounded. And so I struggle a lot with that and about our bodies in space and time and how 
the way you understand your own healing journey, how do you think about like temporality and embodiment and also around like stillness and movement, uh, silence and sound and silence and um, presence? Like how do all of those things kind of inform mm. your own healing journey? So you don't mm. have to answer that now. We're going to just take like a whole range of questions from the audience please raise your hand if you have a question. Um, and then if you aren't wanting to unmute and ask your question, feel free to write it in the chat and I will uh, read it out. So I see um, Ariel with the question and then we're coming to Aisha next. Hey, Ariel. Hi, thank you so much for calling on me. It's been a fortune to listen to this wisdom. My name is Ariel. Um, I practice Nutrient Buddhism and I was born into that practice. So that's the spiritual practice that I'm most acclimated to. Um, at the same time, I recognize um, just my ancestors and um, just the lives that they live and how the life I'm living is really healing a lot of the trauma my family experienced. Mm -hmm. um, I want to connect with my ancestors. I'm also aware of just my unique intuition, the way um, I'm a dreamer. I have very vivid dreams. I dream like every day. And um, I'm able to like read people. So I want to know like, how can I connect with my ancestors? in a way that is genuine and also affirm my own intuition and kind of grow that. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ariel. We're gonna go to Aisha and then Candace in the chat and then Amara, you can kind of okay. respond, you know, as yeah. you feel moved. Um, hey, Ish, good to see you, sis. Blessings so much. I'm just like so honored and blessed and thankful i feel highly favored to just be in this experience today with y'all and i feel <laughs> i just got a wave of emotion that came over me and then my question went out the window so i'm just going back in that gratitude and thank you so much for just um sharing your experience and your obedience um with just allowing spirit to guide you <laughs> and re for um really opening up this space and inviting all of us here today i feel really th really thankful mm -hmm. um so i work with um be imaginative and our work is very much around ancestral healing and it's been so powerful and I'm forever thankful and counting the synchronicities even today as I'm watching how the ancestors have been showing up for us exponentially. And, um, you know, sometimes in this work, a lot of times it's, really, it's heavy and it's dark too, as well, as well as, you know, as calling in the light is the both end. So I would love to know like concrete, um, tangible ways that you take care of yourself after you know after a ritual after uh, uh, um, your conjuring art and performance and how you take care of yourself and your community and your audience but especially yourself <laughs> um, when doing this work thank y'all so much Ashe, thank you so thank much. you I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. And I see two questions in the chat uh, from Candace and Amaya. So I'll read those. And then Amaya, you can kind of give us your reflection. So Candace is saying, what are some ways we can better hear from our ancestors and spirit guides? And Candace is also asking, how do we know what spirit guides, deities are working with us personally? Mm, I got the same question. Yeah, like how do we know our spirit guides how do we come to know our spirit guides and then Amaya's wondering as someone who has experienced a lot of trauma too and with my body I would love to know some practices or tools that can support healing movement as I grow to be comfortable in my body again I say thank y'all so much for these mm -hmm. powerful beautiful mm -hmm. questions and so Amara will come to you um yeah. you know for your reflections on those questions and any other like final comments before we close out 
yeah um well there's a lot around like um the, the i would say the intersecting point is around the work with ancestors and the healing work and how to keep ourselves safe and grounded um mm, and 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 to also clear ourselves from uh energy that or information that comes from the ancestor realm yes we are all intuitive beings and some of our intuition has been suppressed um so it's it's about reclaiming so i think everybody you know so it's not that some people are psychic everybody is psychic and you know, we all are at different levels of reconnecting to that, those abilities or, um, yeah, those abilities. So uh, let me say the first thing that comes is um, around ancestor, around connecting to one's ancestors and knowing which are the ancestors that are the guiding ancestors, um, how to, uh, uh, um, to connect to ancestors in a way that is um, authentic. One is trusting yourself, that you trusting your, um, your intentions. First and foremost, your relationship to your ancestors is yours. So um, I say, what helps in these processes of, you know, finding out which ancestors, connecting to the ancestors is practice is developing simple simple practices of whether it's um sitting in med meditation and i know ariel you were saying you are buddhist like there is you know perhaps devoting um one of your um your meditations to connecting to your ancestors um you know uh, some people like to set up shrines other people don't feel comfortable with that but you know if you are comfortable with designating a very small space that is where you go and sit and talk to your ancestors keep a notebook maybe a glass of you know water um in, you know, a clear glass of water for the ancestors. Um, it can be very simple. It's just about practice. You know, I think of it like any relationship. You know, I can call somebody a friend, but are they a friend if I haven't actually tended that relationship? And I just say, oh, what's that? Oh, I, um, I thought I, I heard somebody. The ancestor saying Ashe. <laughs> okay, there it is. Yes, right. Exactly. Exactly that. Right. So it's like it's it's about tending a relationship and starting really simple. You know, um, the idea that we don't have an existing relationship with our ancestors, whether conscious or unconscious, is part of the decolonizing process. You have it. You are here because of them, because of the your blood ancestors. You know, you are here. Um, and so that connection is there. And so it's just about a matter of tending that relationship and being consistent, whether it's once a week once a day, once a month, whatever you designate as that time to sit. Um, in terms of clearing energy is, you know, um, using things simple like water, you know, have a vessel of water that's not a vessel for the ancestors, but is a clear vessel that you can just anoint your head. Maybe you sit, if you're someone who receives information and, and a lot of information that can feel overwhelming, carry water with you so you can clear yourself um so that you can also develop an understanding around you know you might get information that's for somebody else but we also want to be mindful that even if that ancestor says you need to tell so and so such and such you've got to also regulate whether that information is going to be welcome so always asking people like um i think i have a message from you from an ancestor do you want to hear it right 
We have to, you know, be mindful of that so that that energy doesn't stick with us or, you know, um, be able to let that, you know, that that spirit know I cannot do this right now and just like clear the space with water. Sending an ancestor away doesn't mean that you're never going to get information again. It's part of your um, development and and to to stay to st i want to say centered not grounded earth is a spinning rock in the universe good luck with being grounded right so that is a fleeting thing right because we're in constant motion so more about how do you find your center and this is really important because i know somebody said something about centering in the chaos yes that means we have to, mm, I believe, you know, for myself, well, I'll speak for myself in my practice is that I have to be recentering all the time because whether it's the chaos of, you know, oh, my busy schedule that is like calling my attention and making me go without food or without drinking water, right? It happens. This is the world we live in is set up to keep us from being centered, right? So we have to find what are the practices for, for ourselves where we can recenter, recenter, you know, whether it's having like a crystal or, you know, some sort of talisman or some sort of object that you have endowed with the power of your grounding. You know, I have this blue adventuring stone that helps me a lot that when I start, you know, and rocking, so I do a lot of rocking and I do a lot of holding of, you know, my stones to help me reground when my whole life is, you know, the, the aspects of my life are at play to get me out of center or decentered, right? So how do you find that space? Also, again, community cultivate if you don't already have communities of support that are like you know what are your you know where and where they where they're in reciprocity as well so you know i have a few close people that when i feel when i get ang anxious and i forget what i know and i need to be reminded because patriarchy and white supremacy get me confused sometimes and i forget who i am that is not your fault. This system did not intend for any of us to be in our power. So, you know, who is your network of support who you can call upon and be like, listen, I, can you remind me? Am I, you know, can you remind me of who I am? Or I'm feeling really afraid. I just need some words. Or I just need you to listen to me and not give me advice, but just listen, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know? Um, we don't need to be each other's therapists, you know? Um, but what we can do is be supportive of one another, you know, so that when we have those moments, shaking, rocking, um, you know, there are all kinds of embodied practices to move things. One of the, yes, what you're doing, Re, exactly. You know, circling the head, move your body, move your body, because when you move your body, you shift energy. If you sit in front of the screen and you, you prioritize your head and keep everything in your head, it will not move and it will get stagnant. All you got to do is move your body, tapping, brushing, deep breaths, <laughs> that kind of, you know, these are available to us. This you can do. This you can do. And you know, and you move your body regardless of level of movement ability. Move. Move. Whatever you can move, move. You know, and so these are and and where do you where do you find the time in a day to do that? Where do you make little post-it notes for yourself on your walls like Remember to drink water. Remember to anoint your crown with fresh water. 
to clear energy. These, these things you do not have to pay for. You know, it's not, and, and doesn't depend on um, capitalism. You don't need, you know, the tools of capitalism to find your center and be connected. Thank you so much, Amara. And I just uh, also want to name, there's some additional questions in the chat. I'm so sorry, we're not going to get to them, but I just want to read them out loud just to honor y'all's inquiries. Um, Sherelle said, what are some practices we can do in the darkness that will bring grounding in the midst of chaos? I think you answered that one. Anisha said, how do you protect yourself Ooh, from other, fo ancestors, other folks' mm -hmm. ancestors? I often experience encounters where ancestors are sharing information of strangers that seem too personal. Child, me too. I often feel conflicted about that information, especially when it comes up in healing work as a, a professional counselor. Wow. Thank you so much for that question. I'm going to just read them all and mm -hmm. any final reflections and we're going to close mm -hmm. out. But thank you so much. I resonate with that question. Uh, for those of us who are looking to cultivate new pathways in, a, in the world via the medical field, mainstream media, et cetera, what are some of the successes and challenges you've had around bringing such deep spirit work and grassroots healing efforts into the greater nonprofit commercial academic sectors? Thank you so much for that, Jess. Um, and then uh, Kesey is saying, how can I connect with my ancestors and know who I'm connected with as a person who was adopted with little um, knowledge of my biological family? Thank you so much for that question. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just wanted to read all of y'all's questions yeah. and honor these beautiful sacred inquiries. Um, and just invite, and again, thank you to my students. Y'all see, I'm trying so hard with the time. I do just want to make, uh, just give one final invitation uh, to Ramona and Amara. Um, if it's just like, you know, 60 seconds of like final thoughts and reflections um, on these inquiries and any closing words um, for our folks. Well, I will say a couple of last things based on these questions darkness ritual, give it a ritual. Um, you know, I'm a big uh, lover of when I feel that I need to do my womb darkness work, I create a space, you know, I go lay down in the dark and try to have as much darkness and just breathe and just be open and with the intention of calling the healing uh, properties of the dark to ascend upon me, the healing and speak on that. And you can have music, you know, um, that is soothing, but to allow yourself to be in the dark. And if you're afraid of the dark, maybe you have somebody sit with you to do that again, community support, um, in working in the sectors, which, you know, was why I, these other environments where they don't understand spirit, I had to insist. End of story. It's like, mm, this is who I am. And you can, I'm not asking anybody to agree with me, but um, this is my approach and this is the way I speak on things. And to have you know, to develop the courage to be able to withstand when people you know, mm, disagree or are not down with it, that's okay. Not everybody has to be down with it. It doesn't make you wrong, right? It's, you know, and so, and that comes through practice as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll say around being adopted, yeah, I mean, um, you can, that information can come with you sitting with your ancestors and, and really trusting what comes to you trusting that information. You can also start to look at, you know, people who are doing ancestor work who can sit with you in ceremony, who might be proxies for those ancestors and who can give you information. So again, this is collectivity. This is like being in relationship with others. Um, and temporality, I will just say really quickly, like, 
Again, decolonizing our relationship to time. The past, present, and future are always happening. They're always coexisting. It's a circle. It's not a straight line. The past is not behind you and the future in front. It's all moving. And, you know, in my, in, from my point of view, I will say, and so what does it mean to see all, the past, present, and future taking place all at once? Because they really are. We started an hour ago that technically is now in the past. Yet here we are in this moment, which is now technically in the past, <laughs> right? In the future being this thing that is yet to come, except for that it's happening now. You know, I think uh, one of the byproducts of slavery was to convince uh, enslaved people on the plantations, like, oh, it's going to be better when you get to heaven. We were sold this idea of the future being something that you'll get to at one time, at some time, except for that in, you know, from a white Christian perspective, we were not considered human. So we weren't getting to that future that we were sold. So I say, think of the future as already being generated to reclaim our relationship to um, our, our, our healthy relationship to time means get out of the linear thinking. It's a circle like the womb, like the earth, like our bodies, right? Like the feminine. Ashe, thank you so much, Amara and Mona. I just want to invite you to say any final uh, 60 seconds thoughts, reflections. Mona is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, practitioner, uh, spiritual, sacred being. And so, yeah, I'm just excited for you to close us out uh, with words. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. This energetic collective would not be the same without us present and without each presence in this room. And I'm grateful to share this light with you and grateful to take this light out into the world with me. Ashe, thank you for the gift of you, your words and your energy, your presence, your thoughts, your prayers. This has been truly sacred and a circle I look forward to continuing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Amara. Thank y'all for being here. Thank you, everybody, for your beautiful questions. Thank all of y'all just for your energy and your presence in this space. I'm so, so grateful. Um, so as we close out, for those of y'all who are new, we play a little tune. We do a little survey. This survey is an opportunity to give deep gratitude to our panelists, to let Mona and Amara know how what they have shared today resonated with you. So please do go ahead and fill out that survey that is in the chat. And while we are doing that, I'm going to play from our Black Girl Feel Good playlist. And if there's any other words y'all want to share in the chat, please do. We're going to close out in about four minutes. Just wanna do both. Go ahead. Mm -hmm.